And good afternoon. It's afternoon where I am on Eastern Daylight Time. And uh, first, I think, Ron, uh, we need to, I, I'd like to introduce you. You are the co-founder and medical director of the Southeast Autism Research and Resource Center. Uh, that's very impressive. I think the first question parents want to know is, how do people reach you? Okay, well, um, I wear two hats. Um, the first hat is I'm a developmental pediatrician. And as a developmental pediatrician, I see children and adults in a regular child development center called the Melmed Center. Up, Ron. I'm having trouble hearing you. Okay, um, I can try and make this louder. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Okay, so um, I'm involved uh, as a developmental pediatrician in seeing children and adults with developmental challenges. Lots of them have autism and other associated problems. Uh, in addition, um, I am the proud co-founder of the Southwest Autism Research Center. And in that context, most of what I do relates to research, um, new um, me methodologies of treatment, of identification of children with autism. Um, so parents are often referred to me or adults or refer their spouses or they come to the, to the, um, the child development center um, referral by their pediatricians or by their internists or by their friends or from the schools. Um, other children are funneled through into the research projects once they enrolled in the Southwest Autism Research Center. I'll call that SARC for short because that's easier. Uh, you know, you, you use the word, Ron, screening. Uh, can you explain it to us? Well, we think that the age of children being diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders is way too old. Um, numerous surveys across the countries have demonstrated that we need to be addressing the diagnosis of children earlier. And the only way to do that is going to be through screening projects. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has, um, has published the, the the recommendation that children, all children, every single child should be screened as being at risk for autism between 18 and 24 months. And at SARC, we've developed a screening program and there's several pre-screening programs across the country which endeavor to encourage physicians to do that screening between 18 and 24 months. However, there is a large group of children out there who pass that screening, but nonetheless remain at risk. And these are the children, for example, who used to be called Asperger disorder kids. Individuals with Asperger disorder who have near normal language and, and no significant cognitive impairment, those children might pass screening between 18 and 24 months. And it might only be when they enter into a school situation, into a group learning situation, that the challenges become about. And that's why we've developed a screening tool for school-aged children, specifically to identify conditions which have a later onset, appear to have a later onset in terms of the presence of symptoms than do typical children with autistic disorder like we've seen in the past. So we have a two-fold system of screening, one between 18 and 24 months, and another program called Think Asperger's, which we, which we encourage all school teachers to perform on all kids in the classroom um, in the elementary years. Uh, That's do you the screening find, process. Are, are there other disorders connected with the autism? Well, autism... Um, never travels alone. There's always other conditions associated with autism. For example, I don't think it's possible to have an autism spectrum disorder and not be anxious. Every single one of us, you, Eustacia, me, everyone listening, we all have a degree of anxiety, some of it higher than others. But just imagine that you were put into a situation where you didn't understand the rules. You didn't even understand the language you weren't sure what was going to be expected of you. You've had a history of messing up in a lot of different situations. 
Would you be anxious in that context? Of course. And that's why almost every child with autistic spectrum disorder has associated anxiety. Whether they actually meet the criteria of having an anxiety disorder, that's something different. But that's an example of a co-occurring condition in autism which definitely needs to be identified. The problem is of anxiety. And there are many other problems similarly in the mental health realm which travel together with autism uh, over time. Well, I was thinking also of the connections to the gut. And it's always interested me that we use the expression, my gut feeling is. So clearly, we already have a sense that we are feeling something about a situation and it's not necessarily located in our brain. And there are many of these children who seem to have real gut problems, digestive problems. Uh, you're a pediatrician. Do you... Do you is this common or is it exceptional? No, it's extremely common. It's, in fact, it would be unusual to see a child with autism spectrum disorder, especially in the younger years, who doesn't have gut-related problems, gastrointestinal symptomatology. That could be diarrhea, that could be constipation, that could be reflux, that could be a mix between all of these issues. Um, it, they all can be a, a problematic. However, let me just like pose a different situation to you. And just let's think about anxiety. What is the first thing ha that happens when you are anxious? The very first thing which happens when any one of us is anxious is that we have change in our biorhythms. Our pulse rate changes, our respiratory rate changes and goes up. Our, every system in the body which is normally functioning on a rhythmical basis changes the rhythm. And that pertains as well to the gastrointestinal tract. Sometimes we, when we get very anxious, we need to go to the bathroom really quickly. We lose our rhythmicity as far as regular circadian rhythms is concerned. And this impacts gastrointestinal function as well. So... While there might be many other medical reasons and associations for gastrointestinal problems in children, one of the issues that I once again look at very carefully is the relationship between stress and anxiety and bowel function. And that's a very important thing that I think any medical doctor taking care of these children has to pay great attention to. Do you so, see some of these... Uh, qualities reflected in the parents. Do you feel that there's there's a uh, that there's a vulnerability toward the problem of autism or of concurrent problems of of gastrointestinal gut problems? Do you see some of this reflected in the generation that has come before? Well, listen, autism, you know, first of all has some incredibly terrible myths which have been attached to it from the past regarding the whole issue of refrigerator mothers and everything that we've, thank God, buried long since past. So I think we always have to be very sensitive when looking at parents' situations and talking about their, um, their, their problems and thinking that somehow they might be causatively or etiologically related to their children's problems. So I want to first of all say that we have to be very cautious about that. Having said that, autism is a genetic condition. We know that there's a neurobiological underpinnings and that they know that there's a significant um, um, uh, genetic challenge within this population. And clearly, as a genetic problem, it's very likely that the previous generations had similar symptomatology. There might be issues related to social anxiety. They might be related even to anorexia nervosa. It might be related to um, obsessive compulsive challenges. Giftedness, for example, is very common. There can be lots of different traits that are evident in the parents. We also know that anxiety itself has a strong hereditary component. So if it's a very anxious mother and a very anxious father, there's very likely to be 
a proclivity towards anxiety within the children as well. So yes, there's often a family history which needs to be taken very carefully. And once again, being sure that there's no blame or shame or anything else attached to that situation, which needs well, to be identified. Just, just, what I was going to come to, uh, we, we look at um, our children who are on the spectrum and we do not look at ourselves that, uh, that we're social creatures. It's a two-way street. And uh, I w uh, what I'm always interested in is how does this, uh, how the way in which the parents look at their child, how does it affect both the parents and the child? Uh, do you find there are parents who are in denial, that there are parents who disagree about what you suggest for a regime? Oh, what do we do with that social tangle? There's, there's no question about it. You know, the, the dyad is essential to address. You know, sometimes people ask me, so why do you see a child in follow-up? What is the point of a doctor seeing the child every few months, looking at what needs to be done for that child? Now, there are many things, but I'll tell you what I focus upon on every single visit, is what is, how does the mother feel? How does the father feel? Are they depressed? Have they given up? Are they tormented? Are they anxious? Maternal depression is a significant concern in this, in this population. And once again, because of the evils perpetuated by the previous generation in terms of, the, uh, um, in, in terms of what we spoke about earlier, parents are often reluctant to participate in opportunities where they might benefit from mental health counseling, for example. That it's clearly nothing to do with the etiology. But we know from all children, all typical children, that maternal depression has a significant load on the eventual outcome, a negative load on the eventual outcome of any child. And I'm pretty certain it would be the case in children with autism as well. So the first thing that I'd like to always emphasize is, how does mum feel? Who's filling up her tanks? How does she feel about having a child with autism? How does dad feel if there's lucky enough to have a dad around? How are they supporting each other? Who's blaming? How do the in-laws impact that situation? What is the mother's mental health status? How many contacts does she have in the community? Is she so scared to leave the house for fear of other people pointing fingers at her for having a child with autism? Or has she accessed the appropriate resources to ensure that she feels empowered and knows exactly what to, he knows exactly what to do? So that's one set of circumstances. I realize it's not entirely according to what you said, what you asked about. The second issue is denial. Denial is a normal function. It's one of the normal, typical stages that one goes through when one hears bad news. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has told us about the stages of denial in individuals going through the, um, the process of grieving when a, a close family member dies. I think in those situations, we have to be very sensitive and very cautious about letting parents know how we feel about things. We have to, yes, certainly be positive and optimistic and identify the child's strengths, but at the same time, be appropriate and direct about addressing the challenges that need to be addressed. I think a lot of the times we can give parents time to absorb and time to digest the information. We don't have to slam them into submission saying tonight is the time you've got to start making a difference for your child letting the parents go home and giving them information to read and resources to access and having an ongoing conversation with them about what's actually happening in terms of their um, acceptance of the child, their husband's acceptance of the child, the mother-in-law's acceptance of the child. Knowledge is a powerful coping tool. And in situations where denial is apparent, I revert back to that. Let's educate the parents as to what's typical, what they need to expect. Here's the problem, Ron. To educate yes. them about what? 
You see, part of this problem is identity. If your child doesn't know who you are, who are you? And that's the bind that I find with all the parents that I meet, that they they no longer are sure of who they are themselves, and they're not sure they're good parents. And they get some of that also in the big outside world because they will be going somewhere with their child and their child will have a meltdown and then people will turn and scorn them. So there's an isolation going on and it keeps being reinforced back and forth. And part of the problem is I don't think the parents fully understand how the mind goes of some of, or most of the minds that I run into of those who are on the spectrum, how that mind scheme runs. And I think the mainstream doesn't understand at all. So we have a problem that's not just a, a medical pediatric problem, but it's a social problem. And this yeah, is what I don't know the answer to it. I'm just very aware of that problem and wanted to know how you have, how when you find yourself facing it, how do you, what do you say? How do you handle it? Um, I think, you know, in, in there, there are a number of different uh, points that I'd like to bring up. First of all, as you were talking, I reached into my wallet and I took out a card. And the card is from the Autism Society of America. And it says... Helpful hints. It's a it's a size of a credit card. It's a business type card, and it says helpful hints for interacting with someone who has autism. That's a very practical little card, and, and I love the fact that the Autism Society of America has published this. And I give these to parents, and I say, when you're in a supermarket and your child's having a meltdown, or when you're at a family gathering and a first cousin says something mean. <laughs> take out one of these cards and give it to them. Educate the public. Educate the people around you. Educate the first cousins, the grandparents, the in-laws, the teachers, and those mean people in the supermarkets who look at you and make you feel like you're, the, like you're the scum of the earth because your child's having a temper tantrum at the checkout counter. Well, so that's just a first, believe... very practical thing to think about. Well, from a practical point of view, I believe strongly in integrating these children and integrating them at a very young age because it's my experience that uh, very young children don't make any judgment. They accept the tantrum or they tell tell the other person not to do it, but they, they're not as thrown off as we are as we get a little older. I, I've I, been I witnessed classes no. where they were pre-K, where they were maybe four years old, and struck by the fact that the, those who were more able helped those who were less able. And I love that. Yeah, and that, 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 um, that integration has to start, as you say, very early on. There's so many children who go to self-contained programs, and they think that there's a promise that if they keep on being in those programs in five or ten years' time, they're suddenly going to graduate and go into the mainstream. Can, can you get Thank a little you. closer to the mic and, uh, so I can hear you better? Okay, I is that think, better? I, I lost you right then. Uh, so what I'm saying is that integration has to start very, very early. It's got to start in the first years of life. I Preschool. Agree. Absolutely. There's no the children uh, with autism have too. very little to exactly i think things are changing slowly because i think more and more we understand that intervention has to such as pivotal response therapy ha, um, a treatment has to take place in a naturalistic environment children have very little to learn from other kids with autism so putting 20 kids who are nonverbal with autism together makes absolutely no sense at all they've got to have typical role models typical peers who will serve as language and behavioral models for uh, them. And, and, that's, and that takes a decision from, from up high in terms of edu every educational environment. I have to tell parents, you go to that school district and you fight for that because this is your child's one chance. They're not going to be integrated suddenly in the eighth or ninth grade, having been in a self-contained program up till then. It's got to start right away. 
And as you so rightly point out, the typical children learn so much from that. It's beneficial to them as well. I would just like to add that I know that one of the reasons for Temple's success is she was included in the school and the neighborhood from the very earliest years. And even she has said, well, I had to learn to play the games by the rules, otherwise the other children wouldn't let me play with them. So I learned the rules and I played with them. Well, uh, she was very lucky that you had the foresight to doing that. And I wish that uh, every parent was, um, um, with child with autism would be is listening to you today because that's essential advice. I couldn't agree more. Uh, there are, I, I think, uh, there was something here that I wanted to raise by note. There, uh, did you read the article by Kathy Lord that came out in the New York uh, Sunday Times magazine? Uh, and she made the point when they talked about children being cured that uh, she didn't think too much. Her remark was best possible result. And then she said, and I'm quoting her, when you get too focused on getting to be perfect, you can really hurt your child. A typical kid fights back against that kind of pressure. But a kid with autism might not. It's fine to hope. It's good to hope. But don't concentrate so much on that hope that you don't see the child in front of you. So I wanted to know if you'd like to add to that. Well, you know, I think that I'm thinking of um, John kabat and other folks involved with mindfulness, that when we are able to see our children against the sky and accept their strengths and accept their weaknesses and accept them as beautiful individuals, it goes such a long way to, to success, to having a child who feels good about themselves, who can, who can actually optimize their final outcome. And I think that's probably what, uh, what, Kathy, Lord is, what, what Kathy Lord is saying. We have, to be a rea we have to be a realistic, certainly, but every one of us are flawed in one way or another. And I think the issue is that when that children are incredi incredibly sensitive to their parents' perspectives, they're incredibly sensitive to the, even the slightest comment, um, especially from fathers. One of the mothers once told me what, t what has taken me a lifetime to support in terms of my child's self-esteem, my husband can destroy in a second. I think she was being kind of tongue-in-cheek about that. But fathers often do things without thinking necessarily, without being mindful. Um, but I, I would agree exactly with, uh, with uh, Kathy's sentiments. Uh, do you think it's harder for men than for women? Helping well, I think the parent I, I actually, the on the spectrum. Yeah, w without getting too stereotypic involved, you know, first of all, you know, when we're talking about the genetic component, it's not that unusual for me to be sitting across a family talking about children with autism and describing some of the symptoms with a mother pointing a finger to the father and saying, that's him, that's him. So uh, certainly in those situations, that makes it even, that makes the challenge even more complex. Yes, However, on, on a very practical basis, mothers, possibly stereotypically, have more opportunities to attend IEPs, to go to speech therapy, to go to occupational therapy. It's not very common that fathers attend the visits in my office. I wish it were, and I always encourage them to do that. Mothers have a more have greater opportunities to discuss with well, teachers at school. The problem we have is that these are boys, and they need their fathers to learn how to be men. The, absolutely, if absolutely. The, if the fathers and, don't involve themselves, how are we going to get there? Well, I think that once again, it's got to do with education. It's got to do with fathers, and we uh, we had a program here in Phoenix called Daddy Boot Camp for daddies to learn about how how helpful they could be in the in in these particular situations. I've seen videos of mothers have taken of fathers trying to teach their children how to play soccer or how to play football and putting the ball on the line and expecting the child to follow the rules about how to. I'm I'm not very football savvy, so forgive me for any. Um, 
you know, mislabeling of all the way, or how to pass the ball. And the children don't do that. They pick up the ball and they run to the other end of the field. And the father says, oh, God, nothing's going to happen. It's very hard for fathers to go on a Sunday morning to the park and see all the other children having a great time interacting with their children, with their, with the other kids, and them having an extreme difficulty watching their own child in the corner. There's nothing short of education. We've got to get fathers involved from a very earlier time. We've got to make the information accessible to them. Father support groups, which I've been involved with, are the most wonderful things that any community can have. There's so many support groups for parents and children with autism. How many fathers attend those groups? Less than 10%. It's very unusual. We've got to figure out how to make it something that fathers can feel comfortable in going to. Individuals well, who often have difficulty I, I think, with emotion. I'm thinking the fathers that I run into seem to feel that they have to be doing something very specific, whereas actually all they need to do is just be with their child. Even if they're, I don't know, they've, they're mowing the lawn together. They've, uh, they're doing a little carpentry together uh, in the house, something that needs they to be fixed. They're, that you not have to be therapists. It doesn't have to be a great project. It can just be a shared activity that isn't... Uh, isn't something planned. We seem to be scheduling our children now, all children, into play dates, into special activities. I, I don't know why. Uh, sometimes it's just being together and we'll both plant the radishes in the garden uh, and rake the leaves because fall's coming and there's going to be a lot of leaves to rake. Uh, we looking at it as a planned activity, and I believe strongly in what is not necessarily planned, just what we do together. Uh, you are doing a lot of research, Ron, and of course the question that everybody wants to know is, do you feel that autism is on the increase? Um, I think that we're, we're definitely diagnosing it more, we're definitely finding it more, we definitely, especially, we're looking at two um, groups that we're looking at finding a lot more children, and that's the older children with whom in all, who have always been uh, autistic, but whose symptomatology only expresses itself in the school year, school age years. We've seen that situation. Um, I do think that the numbers of children are increasing, though, overall, despite that, in a similar fashion to the way the number of children with asthma is decreasing. And the number of children with obesity is increasing. And the number of children even with diabetes mellitus is improving with, with juvenile diabetes. So there does seem to be something afoot which is resulting in an increase in many of these disorders. And autism is leading the way as far as that increase is concerned. Do you think that there's a role of pollution? I don't think that we can have polluted the world so badly for so long and then not be a price for that. As to how we can ever be sure and how we're ever going to be closer to the camera, you seem to head to the microphone. You have, I'm losing you again a little bit. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I think that, as I said, they, they would, uh, it would be expected, I think, that there would be a price to pay for the amount of pollution and the amount of toxins that we've dumped into the environment as to how that's actually going to be proven, as to whether that has contributed to the increase in numbers of children being diagnosed with autism, that's a very tall order. And I don't think that we're going to easily be able to access that information for a long time to come. Well, I'm told, or I've read, that there's pollution in umbilical cords. What does that mean to an unborn child? Well, unfortunately, many pregnant women are exposed to numbers of different toxins, you know, from the simple factor of them having um, painted the room, laid down new carpet. Um, that's one example. Depending on their diet, that would be another example of potential, um, uh, uh, potential toxins uh, that they might find. And then we know in the first passage of meconium, looking in the meconium, that we can actually see increased toxins in children who have been exposed in that way. So I think parents have to, uh, and every single mother who's pregnant today is very concerned 
clearly very concerned about having a child with autism. And they all, whenever you know, there's a question and answer session amongst women of childbearing ages, that's the first question that pops up. The first person to raise their hands. I'm pregnant. I have a cousin who has autism. I have another child with autism. What is it that I can do? Do you think uh, there's all this talk now about older fathers contributing to the possibility of autism? Do you feel there's that's there's validity in that? I think it's an association. It's a it's probably a valid association about how much overall it actually com contributes to the increase rate of children being diagnosed with autism. I think I think that would be clearly overblown. Let's f make no error. The number one reason to have a child that you'd likely be at risk for having autism is when your identical twin has autism or when a sibling in the family has autism. The associations that exist in that situation um, makes any other association pale. So these other concerns, certainly there are concerns about older fathers and there's concerns about pollution and there's concerns about many different things. But I think overall they contribute um, to a relatively small, to, to, in a relatively small fashion to the increase in numbers or to the diagnosis of autism per se. Common things occur commonly. It makes for good media attention when fathers get blamed, and maybe some mothers are very happy that for a change, fathers are getting into the neck because they've gotten that into the necks for so long. But at the same yes. time, I think we have yes. to be cautious. Uh, well, uh, here's something that a doctor said to me once. He said, I'm worried about these fertility drugs. He said, why am I seeing so many twins? And one of them's autistic. Do you, what's well, your I take on that? I think we've all been concerned about um, um, uh, about about that, but I think that um, in 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 several studies which have been which have been published, the association is not very as not as high as I think people ex would expect it to have been. Um, in a do um, as so I th you know I think that I'm always very cautious, especially for families with who who are unable to conceive without any assist uh, without any assistance for whom their children are so incredibly precious to then ca cast any negativity or pall on the overall face of that we have to be realistic but the studies have shown they have not necessarily pointed to a strong correlation and and weak correlations are exactly that they're fairly weak autism is on the rise so we're likely to see lots of these studies coming out and lots of correlations being pointed out into the media. Well, and what the media both parents are on. older now. People are not having their children as young as they did once. They're uh, often in late thirties. Uh, well, I, yeah, what that, that, the that, age. Well, that's 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 you know, I, without any con without any question, the older the the older the sperm and the older the egg, the more vulnerabilities that there are genetically. There's no question about that. But I think, as a clinician, once again, I think you have to take into a lot of different circumstances when counselling a family to make sure that we don't make you know dramatic accusations or dramatic pronouncements as to what's actually causing the problem or what's not it's one thing to see it in a in you know in the new york times or to see it in any other newspapers who's picked up but it's another whole thing when there's a real red blooded mom and dad sitting across from you who have heartfelt concerns i, I, I think it's not uh i know the the role of accusation but uh I was thinking of it as, you know, I don't know how many families you advise who haven't had any children at all and are thinking of having children. Uh, what uh, One of my grandsons asked me that question the other day, and I could only tell him what I felt would be a cautious way to proceed. Uh, he's still in his early 20s, so... The time is ahead, but uh, but it's on his mind, and there must be other young men and women where it's on their mind, and 
Who's advising them? Who's helping them? Who's guiding them? What, there's all this talk about, well, you can take the early sperm and the early egg and freeze them, and then you can revive them later on and make them in a Petri dish. Uh, that is, to me, rather frightening. I don't know. I yes, yeah. would, I would, would not I would, want my yeah. life conceived that way. No, I, no, I, you know, it's it's a very real concern. You know, there's a a brother or a sister of a child with autism, and they're going to be they're going to be of childbearing age sooner or later, and they're going to be asking the question. You know, what what are the risks for me? Um, what 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 should I be thinking about? What should I be doing? Now. Yes. I don't think we, you know, I, I hope that the promise of all the research in genetics will actually uh, uh, bear fruit in the near future and give us a clear indication from a blood test as to what, when a child, uh, when, when that is more likely. There are more and more such tests being made available even today, which are available from doctor's offices to look at relative risk in different situations. However, I don't think we have the answers yet. And I think that, that, that I, I'd hate to make two quick pronouncements about how to advise those parents. I usually take a very careful history, sit down with a family, find out about what else is going on, who the spouse is going to, uh, you know, what the spouse's feelings are about the situations, and then come up and often, and often get genetic counseling consultation as well, absolutely, and, and putting all of that together coming up with a meaningful answer for families who have these burning questions for them. It's not easy, and, but I think that quick knee-jerk responses uh, are often irresponsible too, so I caution against that for physicians listening. Are you, Stacia? I'm going to interrupt for just a minute and see if anybody has any questions. They can type those questions to me. Yes, we got some questions. Have we got time for questions? Oh, we've. And I think uh, Judith Gordon. I'm going to see if she can talk. I'm not sure if she can or not. Uh, no, that just put her on the chat. So, Judith, if you can hear me, and I'm going to unmute you. And there you go, Judith. Can you talk or not? I can. Can you hear me? I certainly can, if you would like to ask Ron. We still can't see Ron, but I'm not sure why not. Oh, I'm um, Yeah, we know you're there. So would you like to ask a question, Judith? Uh, I, I actually don't have one ready, but I can just improvise and, you know, talk about my own daughter who uh, is diagnosed as autistic, but she's also very retarded. She also has other brain problems. She only has part of her, a small amount of her corpus callosum and she had big problems breathing at birth. And so she does have autistic autism as well. And when you mentioned about the anxiety that rang a, a bell because she does, she is aware of things and she can do things. She has talents that are down there and she feels very anxious and obsessive about things. So, well, okay. well, thank you. So, do you have any questions or? Well, um, I'm, I just wondered, does he deal with, has he deal, dealt with other more complex, uh, you know, people like this? She is already 30 years old and she also had a, a seizure condition that is practically gone away now. We managed to use diet, a ketogenic diet helped her considerably. Um I'm just wondering if he looks at the a broader spectrum about people like our daughter. Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, but how, uh, she's 30 years old, right? Is she verbal, did you say? Oh, yeah, she's verbal. Yeah. Well, as, as, I, you know, as I said earlier on in the, in the program, um, autism rarely travels alone. There's almost always other associated neurological problems, physical problems, gastrointestinal, sensory issues, obsessive compulsive problems. Um, and it's um, and in every situation, the, um, the, the approach though is pretty pretty much the same. And that's a term that I use called prescription by description. So you know you the more you describe an individual in any which way, if you look at them from a very holistic perspective, um, how they're doing language-wise, vocational-wise, social interaction-wise, self-esteem-wise, health-wise, exercise-wise, 
spiritual wise um, the more you describe each of these elements of an individual the more you're able to come up with a meaning description or what i like to call um, a mandala of how an adult with uh, with challenges is functioning and then in that context come up with a prescription which is based on the description because that's how medicine works optimally when, when we have a description um, of an individual we can come up with a prescription of what it is to do and then it often requires brainstorming as far as addressing each of these issues there might be medical interventions social interventions therapy interventions it's a matter of doing all of these um, interventions one at a time or figuring out an, a meaningful overall approach and I, I know that doesn't specifically address the question that you're asking but at the same time, I wanted to just expand it into telling you how I go about addressing the issues of, a, of autism in adults um, who have complex presentations. Um, but the same is true for children as well. Okay, I hope thank that you. helps. Yes. Um, yeah, actually, actually, one of her first symptoms was uh, the, the problems with her bowels. <laughs> you know, the, just these things, they all seem to fit in. And another, as they grow to adulthood, one of the big problems we face is the programs that are put forth, you know, by the state and the government um, because of the dealing with bureaucracies. That's a big problem. And you know what, Judith, that's going to be one that we really can't get into today. Um, so I'm going to take it back to you, Stacia, because we have a couple of minutes left. And um, I want you, everybody to know that it is you, Stacia's birthday today. So um, I would ask Ron to sing happy birthday, but I'm not sure that would be a good idea or not. Um, but feel <laughs> free to burst into song if you'd like to. But Eustacia, we happy just have a couple of... Oh. to you. That's great. Well, yeah. uh, Eustacia, I actually prefer to celebrate with you when next I see you, and hopefully that won't be too long in the dis distant future. And, and Ron, we would like good to bring to you... you and Ron. <laughs> We would like to bring you and Eustacia out to the uh, Palouse to visit with our parents out here. So you've been out here once before with a family enrichment weekend, and we certainly want to have you come out again. So we'll be getting in touch with you and Eustacia about that, coming out as a team. Uh, I'd love to do that. Okay. So Eustacia, why don't you wrap this up for us and then go celebrate? Uh, yes, and I'm going to be with my family. Uh, as soon as we wind up here, I will go join them. And I'm looking forward to it. And it all points to, uh, Chris, I know you and I believe in this family, that the family is what holds everything together. But then there's the extended family of the community. And I think at, as we go through all of this, I remember with such gratitude, the way that the community embraced Temple, took her in, listened to her problems, Boy, put up with some of her. Yes, she had her meltdowns, and she had her moments. She was, uh, as I've said before, she did not spring like Athena from head of Zeus. She grew up like all children, and there were good times, and there were times that were not so good. But we all worked through it, and she also had three other siblings. And that made us a big, rowdy family. And people have said Temple's funny. And I, I think one of the reasons why was we're a funny family. And everybody else had funny stories to tell when we sat down for, together for dinner. So Temple had her stories, too. And it is that embrace of family and life that seems to me the most important. Let us not put our children into some kind of special category. They are our children. Beautifully said. That was excellent, uh, Eustacia. Um, couldn't, couldn't really add much to that. I think that uh, it's the way our civilization is going to be judged is going to depend on how we treat our kids with ASD. So uh, let's go forth all and conquer and uh, appreciate your educational, um, you know, innovate, innovative way of doing things and bringing this information 
to the community at large. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, good to see you. Okay. Keep well.